Hi everyone, my name is Karan Gupta and I'm hugely delighted to be presenting in this new and uh, innovative event. Uh, as the world changes, I think uh, every, all industries have to adapt and this event is a great example of how uh, we're able to adapt and uh, carry on uh, as it were. Uh, today, I'm gonna be talking about uh, causes and outlook for price volatility in China. Um, as we know, for the last uh, two, two and a half years, we've seen dramatic increases in bearing prices all around the world, but uh, these increases have been disproportionately large in uh, Chinese bearing production. And uh, it's uh, a little unclear as to why that's the case. So a few months ago, I published an article uh, on bearing news and other platforms to uh, discuss what these, uh, you know, what these factors are, why the price are increasing and how much they're increasing by. Uh, just to share some knowledge and, and provide some clarity. Uh, today, I'm here to discuss uh, an update on those factors, what's going on today, how, what, what factors have eased up, what, is, uh, what have been further accelerated, what the price situation looks like today, um, and, and how it continues to change, and share some thoughts on uh, what the outlook of them might be. <clears throat> just to give some background, uh, I'm the head of strategy at KG International. We're a private bearing company uh, based out of Dubai, and we we primarily produce, we have a large range of bearings that we produce in China and India. Um, I, before, before this, I studied in uh, the U United States where I, I got degrees in mechanical engineering and applied mathematics, after which I spent a number of years doing management consulting uh, with Deloitte in the US where I helped uh, Fortune 500 companies grow um, in terms of strategic, strategic growth, mergers and acquisitions, uh, operational efficiencies and uh, other similar uh, engagement types. Um, so without further ado, I want to dig into today's materials, uh, after which uh, there'll be a Q&A session uh, where I'm happy to answer any questions, um, either during the sessions or afterwards through any of our social media channels uh, or directly. So what are the factors impacting market volatility, particularly from China. Um, there are five key factors I'm gonna speak about today. The first is uh, tough macroeconomic conditions. So, uh, you know, this means uh, interest rates, uh, workforce issues, uh, you know, macroeconomic topics that uh, are driving uh, price within, uh, within the Chinese bearing industry. Um, increased price of raw materials, so steel, um, iron ore, that sort of thing. Um, disruption to global shipping, we've all seen that. Um, increased price of energy, particularly true in the last couple of months. Uh, and also China's power crunch, though, the, the, though it's relatively subsided right now, uh, a couple of months ago, this, uh, this resulted in some pretty major uh, price, increases in, uh, price increases in availability issues. So let's start with uh, macroeconomic conditions. Three key things I want to mention. Um, one is that uh, the exchange rate in China uh, of the yuan compared to the dollar has been increasingly um, high. So the Chinese yuan has strengthened, strengthened to about three year highs against the US dollar. And over the last few years, um, we've seen this increase of approximately 11.5%, uh, which automatically is a massive increase to bearing prices uh, fairly directly. Uh, we've seen a ma major issue with global inflation. Um, these uh, have been caused primarily by a uh, pickup in economic activity, since, uh, particularly since uh, we started getting used to COVID um, regulations. Um, commodity prices, supply chain disruptions and input shortages, and of course, uh, major economic shocks. Uh, particularly those the result of the Russia-Ukraine war, which in my opinion will cause inflation to grow. There's also a number of workforce issues. I mean, China has a very aging population. Um, the 65 plus portion of the population have increased by 5% of last decade, extremely high and a, a major concern for factories. Um, the smaller youthful po population to hire from. So, uh, you know, lay, lay, uh, the workforce itself is shrinking, but also that younger workforce wants less labor intensive jobs, which is um, gonna continue to be a con uh, concern over the next few years. Um, and of course, 
this talent this talent attraction struggle is going to be underpinned by a number of retirements just simply due to the aging population. Uh, so massive concern for factories and and there's a serious need for intervention. This is not just in Japan, by the way. I think we're seeing this in all major uh, manufacturing heavy economies. So even Japan and places like that. But uh, I think it's again disproportionately large in China for the current moment. Well, um, what's the outlook for these? I think ex exchange rates, uh, I ex the expectation was that they'll hit pre-pandemic levels by, uh, you know, middle of 2022. But uh, I think still a cause for concern and uh, we still might see some uh, price volatil volatility in the short term. Um, I think um, in general though, in the long term, I think the strengthening will continue. Uh, you know, we've seen the general increase, uh, increasing demand for uh, renminbi dominated denominated bonds, um, and I think we've seen that the Chinese economy overall is actually very resilient, and I, and I think that drives a lot of value for the economy. Uh, global inflation, I think this everyone expects this to grow to increase and fairly drastically, uh, especially on the back of higher energy commodity prices, uh, and um, you know having to navigate all these major economic disrupt disruptions, inc including COVID and the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, the workforce issues, as I mentioned, this this is a massive, massive issue, not just in China. I think uh, I, I don't see this easing up anytime soon. And I think the only way for it to ease up is by uh, factories being able to make significant digital investments so that uh, to stop human capital being the biggest constraint for growth and output. Um, and uh, that's very much in control of the factories we work with as opposed to an economic, uh, a broad economic decision. Uh, overall, I think in general, we can say that these macroeconomic conditions don't seem to be getting any easier um, and, and, uh, and will definitely continue to contribute to uh, increasing bearing prices. Increased price of raw materials. Um, so few factors impacting the price of steel, right? Um, First of all, raw material prices in iron ore, so 94% increase between November 2020 and July 2021. Um, that increase has shrunk since, and I think right now in the last couple of weeks has increased again a little bit, but uh, still remains to be a massive gap between prices pre-2020 and, uh, and prices we're seeing today. And I think factories need to adapt and they've done so by um, increasing prices. Coal prices, uh, we'll discuss that a little bit later, but massive, massive increases over the last year uh, year or so. Um, and I think they, the, the outlook is that they, they will continue to be high. We just discussed some inflation. And of course, uh, inflation is one thing, but fear of increasing inflation is another, is another. And I think generally companies are starting to protect themselves against further inflation by raising prices. We've also seen a variety of tariffs on uh, steel related exports from China. So obviously that has a direct impact uh, on, uh, on bearings uh, and bearing trade around the world. Um, as you can see on the right-hand side of the page, uh, massive, massive volatility over the last few years in steel prices, but the, the jump between 2020 and 2021 is particularly stark. We saw a dip back, but, uh, but uh, the trend is on the rise again. Um, Outlook, uh, I think it'll continue to get worse. Um, you know, as inflation continues to be an issue. Factory shutdowns continue to be an issue. Um, I think the, these shutdowns could be in terms of green energy manner, measures. They could be in terms of COVID outbreaks. They could be in terms of uh, re needing to reallocate supply uh, based on uh, changing demands in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, in any case, I think some, some sort of supply issues will persist. Uh, dependency on Russian supply uh, of uh, particular oil, natural gas, and other commodities, uh, those, will, those you know, will obviously be in flux for a little bit, and uh, um, any dependency will result in price increases. And then general uncertainty, I think that, that's always a, uh, you know, that, that's always a fear, and that's always a reason for increased volatility. I think the Russia-Ukraine war, um, you know, further exasperates that, uh, 
that level of volatility because the level of uncertainty is just that much more in terms of when when we'll see a resolution. Um, so overall, another another reason to for prices to continue going up. Um, disruption to global shipping. This has been extremely extremely difficult over the last few years to navigate. Um, you know, steady increase in container demand. I think in the pandemic or in general in any recession, you tend to see. Pers uh, purchasing shifts from uh, service services to goods uh, at the especially as recessions ease, so I think uh, that causes massive strain, um, and you know that th that strain was not being delivered due to a variety of reasons. So transportation cancellations because ship crews weren't uh, you know weren't operating, which means many many containers were left stranding uh, stranded for a long time. Uh, ports, so ships were docked away from ports for long times while COVID uh, outbreaks eased, which obviously caused major delays and major cutbacks. Uh, and of course, shipping routes, uh, you know, particularly as a result of the Russia-Ukraine war, we've seen a variety of routes being closed, uh, you know, even for other reasons, if you, you know, we saw the Suez Canal being blocked and things like that, which have caused uh, major shocks. And, and that's led to massive price increases um, you know, something in some cases, even 6x between 2019 and, and 21. I think those have dipped slightly, but uh, not not by as much as we would have hoped or thought or expected even, you know, so uh, so planning against this and, and, and getting used to that has, has been very difficult. Um, the outlook is I think supply chain disruptions will will uh, worsen um, for, for the time being, especially amidst the Russia Ukraine war. Um, the China zero tolerance policy will um, will continue to cause shutdowns uh, in the short term. The uh, fuel costs will continue to rise. Uh, global supply chain uh, pressure will uh, will be maintained, and uh, I think we'll see some sort of a bullwhip effect, um, which uh, which hopefully will which may I should say. Uh, which may see an improvement, but uh, definitely not in the short term and definitely not um, not now, uh, not amidst uh, the disruption caused by the Russia-Ukraine war. So overall outlook for me is that uh, it'll persist uh, for, for a while while the Russia-Ukraine war uh, either resolves or, uh, you know, logistics companies can find their way around uh, these, these block trade routes and, and this sort of, you know, big hit to global demand planning. Um, but in the long run, I think we're see, we're starting to see some congestion ease. We're starting to see some uh, le some level of normalcy. But of course, this doesn't just have an impact on price. It has an impact on delivery times, which continue to impact businesses and cause uh, cause concern, uh, in, especially in terms of uh, making on timely deliveries and uh, you know customer satisfaction. Um, increased price of energy. A more more recent uptake than the trends we've been we've been seeing, uh, especially if you look at coal price, that's particularly shot up since the end of last year. Um, you know, oil price largely the same. I think big uptake between end of last year and beginning of this year. Um, so uh, huge soars. I think uh, we see there's already some pivot away from coal, especially because of the Rus dependence on Russia. Uh, our Russia's coal supply, uh, but overall, don't see this easing anytime soon. Um, so, a few thoughts on the outlook. Uh, I think coal prices uh, could go even higher, especially in the short term, uh, because of their dependence in Russia. Uh, use is expected to remain strong, not just within 22, but for the immediate future. Let's look at the next one to three years. Um, I think we see more and more countries prom promising to use cleaner energy sources, which could. Uh, impact demand and help out a bit, but I think there will still the, pr the pressure to deliver coal will still remain, um, and I think uh, we'll see some lower coal supply for for a little bit, uh, even even if we see a quicker resolution to the war. Um, surge in oil, oil prices, uh, I think that you know that says it all. I think it'll continue to go up. Um, so. Though coal prices have increased, they've increased at a smaller rate. 
than uh, than coal, so it could start to look like a more attractive um, source of energy, uh, and, and you know could help ease some of the burden that has been placed on coal. But I think regardless, we'll see a price increase as a result of that. Um, though that's my prediction, there is a scenario where oil prices go down, um, just because uh, there may be a hit on demand. Um, or if, or if we see that Russia's supply persists despite the war. Um, so if there's a quick resolution. But um, in my opinion, I think we'll still see some, maybe not as steep increases, but still some increases um, going forward, for, at least in the short term, the next three, six months. Um, China's power crunch, I think we all, uh, we've all seen a little bit of this, but um, this was basically end of last year where um, you know, there's a massive coal shortage in China. The renewables weren't performing as well as they, uh, as, as well as people thought they would. And uh, President Xi announced a bunch of carbon emission targets that were far from being met. And I think the response was that there were massive, massive uh, power rationing cuts across, uh, I think it was over even 23 provinces. Um, and uh, factors are forced to cut time, activity time, by up to 50%, uh, which of course is a major, major impact. Uh, if you look at the map, uh, most of the provinces hit uh, are very well known for manufacturing. And, uh, and of course that impacts the bearing industry disproportionately um, to others. So uh, that caused a major strain. Uh, it is difficult to measure how much of the reason price increases are as a result of this, um, these cuts, or just all the other things I've mentioned uh, over, over the last few minutes, but uh, it, it of course was a big issue nonetheless. So uh, I th hopefully you've clearly seen what the major factors are in, in, in why these bearing prices are increasing so much. Um, how suppliers and factories are responding has been really what's, uh, what's impacting the industry. So increase in prices we've all seen, and we'll go into that in just a little bit. Uh, but we've also seen some non-pricing uh, uh, issues uh, in terms of dealing with Chinese factories, and, and, and that's brought about significant uh, financial burden on, uh, on our industry, uh, and, and especially Chinese-based Chinese brands, right? Um, so uh, some of these include uh, increase in MOQs. So, uh, you know, in a scenario like this, Chinese factories are uh, are, are only running uh, assembly lines where there is a high financial viability, especially as all these, um, especially as their costs continue to increase so so dramatically. Uh, so that that caused uh, an increase in minimum order quantities. Uh, shipping terms, I think historically, uh, these were you know vary in terms of commercial arrangements, but uh, the burden of shipping was. Uh, at least as far as we saw, was uh, put more on uh, the buyer than the factories, and that caused a massive strain to, to margins and uh, profitability. Um, massive increase in time to quote and, uh, and an introduction of a price expiry. So, you know, uh, what used to take, th you know, a couple of days to quote in the past was taking about, you know, two weeks or so uh, now. And I think a couple of reasons for this. I think one was that uh, there is a lot of lack, a lot of lack of clarity about all the other factors we just dis discussed. So, um, you know, a lack of clarity on what they'd be paying for their raw materials going forward, um, or or what the power regulations are given the the sort of uh, power crunch scenario, and uh, and also there's we also expect suspect that there's some hidden sort of auction like processes going on in the background. Uh, where factories are waiting to see where they can get the best price for their goods. Um, so we got a, the, the time to quote took a lot longer, but also the quoted prices tend to start having expiries, which we hadn't really seen uh, in the past before because negotiation used to take its own time. And now uh, the, the, that process was uh, much more strained. Um, longer lead times, shipment certainty. So uh, bearings, I think this is globally, not just in China, but particularly in China, I think what used to take one to three months or two to four months is, is now taking double that time. Um, and 
causing a much higher need for stocking because back-to-back orders become uh, very difficult for end customers to uh, digest. Um, and then, of course, tighten payment terms. Uh, you know, cash flow continue to be an issue, especially as factories and traders tend uh, were reacting to all the economic conditions we'd mentioned earlier. So uh, payment terms became much more tight, and uh, and uh, cash flows became strained. A quick double click on pricing. Um, so the way this is structured is that uh, we use uh, October twenty twenty as an index. So that's uh, that's one. And um, we try to track how much that price increased over the last year and a bit uh, for each bearing type. Um, as you can see, um, from at least from our data, massive, massive overall increase. Um, you know, I think radial bearings uh, had, had maybe a, a, a disproportionately smaller increase overall, uh, radial ball bearings, but taper roller bearings, self-aligning, spherical, pillar block, uh, also major increases and continue to do so with maybe an exception of, of the pillow block. Of course, uh, we're looking at February 22 data. Uh, so this was right after the Chinese New Year shutdowns. And, uh, uh, you know, we may, we may well and likely will continue to see increases um, over the next few, uh, few months. But, but my guess is that it's slightly lower, lower spaces as there's already too much inflation in these prices. Um, so, you know, something to the tune of three to five percent is what is what we're expecting to see, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. How? Uh, what is the cause of these increases? We already discussed them, but we try to break down a little bit uh, what uh, you know where these increases are coming from. So, um, if you look between October twenty and December twenty one. About a 56% increase if you take an average. And, uh, you know, this is just illustrative. This is the average we saw. Of course, it depends on what bearings you're buying at what volumes uh, at what times. But on average, that's the kind of increase we saw. Um, the breakdown of that is, you know, 10% came from, you know, exchange rate, uh, 6% because shipping increased and the shipping burden was passed on to us or, or onto traders or, or brand owners. Um, Small drop in steel price, but uh, correction, but overall, if you look at the net uh, factory price increase, which I classify as uh, inflation scares, workforce issues, raw material prices, all the stuff that uh, is uh, directly impact, uh, impacting factories, um, we're seeing you know, net about 25% um, increase in prices as a result of those things. Uh, and I include energy uh, in that category too, but I think, the energy part comes in probably after 2021 because that's when we saw the, the serious uh, spike in prices. Um, after December of the last couple of months, and bear in mind this in includes Chinese New Year, about a 9% uh, increase overall. So as I mentioned, the average of about 4% uh, per month seems to persist. Um, and, uh, but uh, of course you can see the overall massive price increase uh, you know, customers have done well to adapt. Uh, we've been trying to absorb as much as we can. And uh, fortunately, uh, we're, we're able to continue stocking, but this becomes a much more difficult task in scenarios like this one. Um, so hopefully you learned a lot more. Uh, this, this paper has been published on our website, so please stop by. Uh, please feel, feel free to reach out to KG on, on any of our channels. We're at the exhibition this year. And are sponsoring, so you can see, uh, so you can see us around. Uh, please do come visit and set up a meeting, um, and that way you can also reach out to me directly if you have any questions, comments, concerns about anything I've said. But of course, I'm here for the Q and A session and looking forward to connecting with everyone. Thanks for listening.